Well, Moyes is well played. Do you leave here disappointed or was that a good result for Chelsea? Uh, well, uh, first, uh, we were, we were to, we want to, to win the game, you know, because it was important for us. If we won the game, maybe we, we want to a third, third place in, in the table. But yeah, it's good. One point. And, yeah, amazing. And I feel like you only score great goals. There was that incredible goal that a lot of people will remember against Bournemouth last season. And now this today, what are you thinking as the ball's dropping out of the sky? Yeah, you know, uh, i grateful, grateful with God first because uh, without him it's impossible to, to do these things. And yeah, I'm so happy for the goal and uh, for the equalise because we, we didn't lose. Uh, the game. And of course you play with the match today. Do you think we're now seeing your best football in a Chelsea shirt? Maybe it took a little bit of time. Yeah, you know, uh, always at the beginning stuff, but now uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great moment for me. I'm getting better and better. And yeah, I'm so happy. Uh, yeah, and I'm told you've been waiting a while for your first Player of the Match award. Incredibly. Is this your first one in England? Uh, no, the second one. The first one was when I scored uh, from the half one late. Of course, you know? of course you got it that day. Of course <laughs> you did. Yeah. Okay, well here's number two. Well played today. Thank you very much. Well Henry. done, Moisey. Well, he is player of the match, and Graham, of course, knows him extremely well, and he, he seems a really good character. You, you pleased for him with the football he's playing at the moment? Yeah, he's really, he's a really nice person. Uh, humble, very humble. Um, just wants to learn, wants to improve, wants to fight for the team. Got an edge about him on the pitch, so he's not the, the, the Mr. Nice Guy, but uh, as, a, as a human being, he's a top. Fantastic, really pleased for him. And you talked earlier about the, um, the expectancy and change of club. Do you, do you think the fee as well, which was enormous, might have affected him in, in any way? Well, I think it's only natural that there's a bit of pressure and a bit of outside noise. And as I said before, Chelsea were going through a transition period, so he's in there. Uh, the team's trying to function better than it was. He's come with £100 million, pounds, whatever, it, you know, whatever the number was in the end. And then sometimes you look at that and you expect a lot for that type of money, obviously. Moises isn't really that type of player, although he's, he's just scored a couple of uh, fantastic goals if you look at his highlights. But most of the time, he's, he's the guy that lets other players play better. Um, gets in good positions as a central midfield player, can deal with the big spaces, but wins the ball back. So for 100 million, yeah, uh, as well, when everything's not functioning brilliantly, there can be some sort of maybe some pressure on him. But I think it's a, question, a, a, a um, testament to his character that he's come through that, and now you've seen the quality that he has. He was only 23 yesterday as well. Do, do you like him? Is he, is he on the upward trajectory now? Yeah, I like him. I, I really do. I mean, out, out of position, I think he's fantastic. I mean, I wouldn't want to play against him out of position. In position, I don't think he's going to hurt you with a ball. He's, and his range of passes is not the best. Um, but he certainly gives everything, leaves nothing on that pitch. Does he train every day like he plays? Yeah, and that was the bit with him to start with. It was just, he, he, he came from Ecuador. Uh, and it's just the, the intensity of training every day in the Premier League. He was like, mm. talking by surprise a bit. He actually went on loan to a team in Belgium, down the bottom of the league. Didn't go so well. He played, but the team was struggling down the bottom so it just took a little bit of time for him just to adapt we always knew he had the quality mm. just the intensity and the difference Phys he's got the physical capacity just getting used to it he looks like a player who's got no self-indulgence he's not trying to perform well for exactly. himself he just wants to give everything for the team um, and I think that his teammates will appreciate that Certainly when there's a lot of superstars, you know, and you talked about the fee, Steve, it's easy to get carried away with yourself and think, oh, I've got to try something different now. And perhaps he did when he first went in there. He thought, you know, I've got to do a little bit more than just run about on the pitch and break the game up. But that's good enough. If he's doing it and he's got the cocktail around him, he's got like the Cole Palmer he can give the ball to him and wacky, you know, and they're getting there, you know, with the, with the cultured players. But he's got to know what he's good at. And what he's good at is what he, what he showed us today, you know, is giving everything for the cause. Mm. And certainly you talk to players who played with him, they speak very highly of him. Yeah, well, look, he's, he's the type of player you want to play with. When you know you play in that position, whether you're the attacking midfielder next to him or you're number 10 in front of him, he's the type that you need. I didn't feel any of the midfield players there really took control of the game. I think mm. that's probably why it was such a Crap. poor game in quality, really, because when you're in that number 10 position, and I've done it, if your midfield players can't get control of the ball... You, you're almost a waste of time being a number 10. You can go in all these areas wherever you want where there's no control from your midfield players and you, you, 
you just you, you become become irrelevant in the game, um, unemployed, virtually. And you saw today with the two best players on the pitch from Manchester United is Bruno Fernandes, most creative player, and on the other side, Cole Palmer, both really quiet today. And that's a subsequent reason why is because. There was just no control from them. Four midfield players. I thought, I thought Ugarte, Ugarte was okay. Foul, too many fouls. Couple of nice bits. Casemiro was probably United's best best player on the day again with that pass and played his position quite well. A little bit disappointed with Lavia today. I thought he was a, a, a little bit better than that. Well, look, he's had an off day today. Let, let's say um, Caicedo probably was best of the four, but I don't think it was that difficult to be the best out of them four today. Okay. What he did have control of was the volley, wasn't it? And you're saying he wasn't particularly known for this. I think it's just his fourth ever uh, Premier League goal. But it was some strike, Graham, less than five minutes after United had taken the lead. Skulls S on the edge of the box, wasn't it? <laughs> it wasn't that good. <laughs> um, a bit too close, that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, Garnacho's probably a difficult role for him on the edge of the box because he's got an eye on Cucurella, but nevertheless, it's a fantastic finish from there. Goes through the bodies, need a bit of luck. But a great connection, that's all he can do and hope for the best, and it goes in the bottom corner. Yeah, it's a tough one. Technique's quite tough there because he's moving backwards at the same time as well. Like you say, Garnacho, he doesn't really do anything in the end. It's, it's a difficult role for him to be in between the two of them. But he doesn't really react to that one and... Look, it's a good strike from Casido. Give him, give him credit for the strike. Difficult one for Anana, wasn't it? It comes through yeah. Mudrick's legs. Mudrick's in an onside position, so it doesn't matter. And it just puts him off. Just that, just slightly struck it well enough to be past him before you even see it. Mm. Casemiro's header um, in the build-up. Anything in in that? Can no. we see this fresh angle here? What's this? Look. Brazil, Argentina. Huh? Yeah, well, it's not good. It's not good. He, I mean, he's got a knack of putting his head on the ball in both boxes, isn't he? You know, he does defend very well and he gets his head in the attack as well and he's a real threat. He's got, he, he would wish he would done better there, but, you know, we're only looking at hindsight because it's ended up in the back of the net with a wonderful strike. I think we've got to give credit to Casado for the strike, really, mm. more than uh, Casemiro. And it's not the first time he scored against United in the Premier League. His first goal came against them when you were his manager uh, on a very memorable day for, for you, him and the team. Yeah, I think it was 4-0, I think. Yes, it yeah, was, Graham. Nice, uh, yeah, stop being so modest. <laughs> oh, yeah, again, little edge of the box. He's going to pick one up. I think it's a decent strike now coming up. Again, a bit fortunate through bodies. Ooh. Maybe he's aiming for that bottom corner again. Yeah. <laughs> and that started, I think it was the first goal in the game, I think. so. Yeah, this was his sixth appearance in the Premier League at the time. He was very, very yeah. new to it. Yeah, that's me prior to a, a glow-up. <laughs> <laughs> a bit scruffy <laughs> yeah you hadn't seen your designer in those days had you so, uh, there's, there's never been a designer I'm sure you. <laughs> Tim still begs to differ don't you <laughs> well I think when he went to Chelsea he, he upped it he upped his game without doubt upped now it, even now I just went to a decent barber that's what I was doing <laughs> he was on the, yeah look, he's on the shortlist to be James Bond <laughs> <laughs> when he goes back in next year he's going to be written off again <laughs> um, you mentioned mentioned the, the ball for the penalty um, yeah. it was a beautiful one wasn't it and, and no doubt it was a penalty in the end oh yeah it was definitely a penalty a really good touch as well from, from Highland but the ball was brilliant it's that, that got a little I know it's got to go in the air but it's a little bit of flatness as well it's the pace of it the trajectory of it is absolutely perfect oh. straight in between him decent touch I think the touch could have been slightly better in it and it could have possibly yeah. got a finish off but once it's a little bit wayward the touch the, the keeper commits himself and it's he definitely catches ankle. It's definitely a penalty, and thankfully Fernandez puts it away quite comfortably. That was Hoyland's first touch in the penalty area, the opposition penalty area. Well, it, it's no surprise, as I said. Yeah, when your midfield players don't get control of the game, it's difficult to bring your forward players into it. And it was no surprise. It took that one bit of quality from Casemiro that we we, we know he's got, and you know we, I want to see Hoyland in their positions a, lot, a, a little bit more. I think he's capable. I think he's got the movement. I think he's clever enough to do that. Again, I. If it was slightly critical, I'd like him, his first touch to be slightly better, a little bit more close to him, so he can then get his shot off. But he ends up doing well, he gets a penalty and United took the lead. Yeah, and Bruno Fernandes hadn't scored in the Premier League uh, for 12 games. Scored two in the Cup in this week, uh, at that end actually. Um, are you ever really in any doubt when he's in this penalty situation? I know he misses the odd one. but Yeah, he misses, he misses the odd one, but you, you always fancy him. Great, great composure, as into um, just a couple of steps of 
and it's a goal. And as you say, he has been pretty quiet. I think he missed a penalty against Chelsea last season as well. So was, you, you have to be, you have to give him credit for being the one to stand up there. I think he always fancy he fancies the free kicks as well. Of course, he does. And the dead ball situation is normally very good and great composure there to to put them ahead. He was Manchester United's goal scorer. He is their captain, and here are his post-match thoughts. Well, Bruno, after a, a challenging week, I guess you needed to fight. You needed to give everything. Do you feel like you at least did that today? No, of course we did. Uh, we couldn't. We could even have a different result. I think we could have won won the game. Not that I don't think that uh, Chelsea deserved to to get their goal and the draw because they they also played a good uh, a good game. I think it was a, a good game from both teams. Uh, obviously, not the result that we wanted. How did you feel stood over that penalty because he saved one from you? last season and obviously for the team as a whole goals have been in short supply yeah obviously he did really well last season uh, I always I always look at uh, at the goalkeeper before facing them last season he did something different uh, against me that uh, he had done previously in, uh, in other penalties uh, and so I changed also the way I wanted to kick the kick the ball and uh, I, I was I was successful so I said in my first question it's been a challenging week captain of the club what has it been like no, oh, every week is challenging here at the club. Uh, it doesn't matter if you win or if you lose. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a different week because we know we all know that Eric Eric is gone, and uh, it's not good for anyone at the club when a manager goes because it means that uh, the the positions and uh, where where the team is is not is not the best. The results are not the best, and then he ends up that the manager is the one that pays. And uh, we obviously are all disappointed by that because uh, when whenever you see a manager go. You always have to take a, a little bit of uh, of the blame on yourself because you need to look at the mirror first. Because if it goes, it's because the team is not doing so well, and everyone as individual has, has to look at themselves first. Yeah, I was going to ask what, what the feeling is like. Obviously, it's always the manager that gets the blame. But do you, do you find as a player you have feelings of guilt, responsibility? You know, what, what more could I have done? Oh, of course. I think everyone has to be aware of that. We we all know that uh, when uh, when the manager leaves, uh, everyone is involved. But o- only one pays because it's easier to get rid of a manager than ten or fifteen players. And uh, obviously, uh, I spoke with the manager after all the all the. Um, the things that you, you spoke with Eric. Yeah, I spoke with him, and I said, I said to him, like uh, I did also apologize to him if, if was there something that I could have done better for him. That uh, that I, I feel really disappointed that um, he, he's gone. But obviously, uh, what what remains with me is, is as I said, he feels that I will as, as, uh, give everything and uh, try to help in a, any way possible. Obviously, I wasn't scoring goals, um, and then then he said, that's a big thing for me and and for the team. And as you said, we're not scoring many goals, and I feel. I feel also a big responsibility on on that because I'm normally a player that scores a lot of a lot of goals, gives a lot of assists, and uh, and was not coming. So I feel I feel disappointed on that. But I always gave my hundred percent to to help him. And uh, for me, the main thing is that he's aware of that and is 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 something that at least I can I can keep in my head. Yeah, it was actually something Rude Van Nistelrooy said in the week with you. Do, do you think sometimes when it's maybe not going as well as it as it could and does most of the time, actually can end up caring too much trying too hard did you feel like you got yourself in that kind of uh, spiral no that both Eric has always said that to me in the time he was here and Rudolf also I had, had a conversation with him he, he also said that but you play for the biggest club in the world so you have to put you have to put pressure on yourself I'm a person that likes to push myself to 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 be better every time so it's just part of me and I, I don't know to, how to do it in, in a different way uh, yeah, I, I need to, to deal better with that with, with the expectations that I have on myself not even with the other expectations forget the outside world yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't mind that uh, mm. because you always know that everyone expects always great things from, from everyone at the club but uh, probably on myself I need to be sometimes a little bit easier but I, I can't it's just like I'm, I want to be always better and that's the thing can these players with obviously the help of a new manager now can you get Manchester United back to where obviously you all feel the club belongs? No, we have to bring it back straight away with Rude, and uh, we we won 
Um, we won for the Carabao. Now we have we had we had uh, a good a good spells in the game where we could have won, but we didn't. So we need points in the in the league. Everyone is aware of that. And now is a main a main game for us in uh, in the Europa League, where everyone knows that we need points as much as we need in the league. So uh, we have to start a bit rude, and then when uh, and the new manager comes, we have to we have to keep going. Uh, is he someone you've crossed paths with, Ruben Amarin, in, in Portugal? Are you excited to play his football to take on his ideas? No, no, I've I've spoke with him twi- one or twice, but when I was going to watch the games of Sporting, and obviously when I go to the, I, I go to the dressing rooms, but nothing nothing major. Um, I, obviously, I watch every game of Sporting because it's my is my team there, and I I know exactly how they play, what they do, and everything. But we never know what the man is gonna is gonna do when he when he arrives here. We have different players. Um, we we. We will think on that after the Leicester game. For now, is to focus on everything we can do to give uh, to give the best for Ruud because he deserves that. Um, he's someone that is always uh, really careful on the words for everyone. tries to get everyone involved, pushes for everyone. He's trying to get uh, his job done uh, as the best as he can. When and, and he deserves that. We we full focus on him now at the moment. Thanks for coming out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Interesting from the Manchester United captain and uh, goal scorer today, Bruno Fernandes. Um, what did you make of that, finding Eric Ten Hag to apologise if he hadn't performed or let him down in any way? Um, it's, it's like you said, it's the manager who ultimately loses his job. I, I think the players were actually trying. Um, and it could have been so, so much different if, if you think of all the chances they've had and chances they've missed. They, they won't be missing chances on purpose. He said that he... He's someone who hadn't scored for, for quite some time and throughout Eric's tenure he did contribute quite a lot but look, he's, he's right, it's, at some point you, you must be feeling guilty as a player that your, your manager's been sacked but again, he's also right in saying that when you don't perform it's not all the players, it's not 10, 15, 20 players going to be sacked it's going to be the manager, he's, he's going to be the one to pay for his job, but look, if, if that's the way he's feel, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of the players feel the same way. What do you think? Oh, I was Any, best... Anyone call you off the villa? What? Any uh, players yeah, to apologise? Yeah, yeah, too late, isn't it? <laughs> too late then. <laughs> You're already on the sun lounger. <laughs> In Barbados. <laughs> um, I think he's, it was the best interview I've ever seen him have. I think he was honest. I think he was, it's true, what he's, what he's talking about. He's taken some sort of responsibility. He realises that every game at Man United is pressure. Um, like we said, we saw the last six games there. They've lost one game in the last six. You know, but it's Man United. That's a disaster. <laughs> you know, when you're not winning enough and you're, there's, there's a lot of draws thrown in there and the teams who they're playing and they've spent 600 million, all that needs to be factored in. But only at Man United. I mean, this is a pressurised environment. I quite liked his interview there. I really did. A lot of the time... You know, I could take it or leave it, but I, f- I was tuned in there, and I really listened to what he had to say, and I, and I feel like he was talking a lot of sense. High praise. Uh, we'll pass that on to Bruno Fernandes. That, <laughs> that Tim was tuned into a post-match player interview. In all seriousness, the, the trying too hard thing. He, he carries that burden. He was honest. He says he doesn't know any other way. And as a manager, you don't really want to take that away from a player like that, do you? No. Um, and, and he'll he'll play on the on the edge of that effort and that ambition. I think the, the, the fascinating bit is if you look at the chances that Manchester United have missed over the last few weeks, it, you know, we talk about fine lines and margins and I think it's probably a, a bigger story in terms of what Eric Ten Hag has done. But if you go on the other side of those margins, which can absolutely happen, all of a sudden it's, it's five wins out of six or it's, you know, it's, it's something just turns the other way. And for whatever reason it hasn't happened and, and then he gets obviously loses his job. But for, for Bruno's perspective he'll just be frustrated as the captain of the club as well that, that when he looks at it and, and the narrative will be we've had chances we've missed chances we should have won the games we haven't won the games and in the end the manager pays because when he's not scoring there is a problem isn't there quite clearly yeah there is yeah exactly so he didn't play for he didn't score for 12 games did he look I don't think Ten Hag was was sacked because just of the lack of goal I think it was more performance identity style of play I don't really think it was so much players' effort. I think players uh, have really tried. They struggled to, to to process what the manager wanted from him, and that's ultimately why why Eric went in the end. I must interrupt you because your former teammate Ruud van Nistelrooy is waiting to talk to us live at Old Trafford. Ruud, good to see you. Oh, um, good evening. A point today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, how was that for you? What did you What did you think overall? Well, I have to be honest that I'm uh, I'm a bit disappointed that we didn't win it. Uh, 
although I'm very proud of the performance of the team, I think overall the chances that we created were a bit better than theirs. Uh, we had a few opportunities that we didn't outplay well, but we had some good counter-attacking moments. Uh, I think uh, the Chelsea goal was, was a great finish, but it wasn't the biggest chance. Uh, so the win would obviously ha have been fantastic, but uh, you know we take the point as well. And on the back of um, the win against Leicester, what was the experience like of managing in the Premier League at Manchester United, a club that means so much to you? Yeah, my, my biggest motivation also in the role as assistant is to help the club forward and to, to help the players um, get better. And, and now in this role, I, I, I also do it. And after the, the Leicester game at home, I go back to the other role and I just want to continue here because this club... Uh, needs to be brought forward and I just want to be part of that. And talking of relationships, Skulls is here because he, he made you look good on numerous occasions, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> he, did he made actually. me look good. <laughs> he did actually on many <laughs> occasions. Just make the run and the ball will arrive, basically that. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Um, Hi, Skulls. Uh, I must admit, Ruth, this week I think you've handled yourself brilliantly. I think with the media uh, especially spoke, spoke really well. Now, I know you have managed before in Holland, obviously did well with, with PSV, I think you won the Dutch Cup there. Is management still something you want to get into? Well, I, I think at the moment, you know, before I came to United, I was, uh, I was looking to manage, uh, no doubt about that. And the, when United came in with this opportunity, for me it was, a, it was a fantastic opportunity. I wanted to be here and I put that aside and for me, that was a deliberate decision to come here and help out. And I just want to stay and, and do the same thing. And uh, so for me, that's, that's my focus at the moment. And finally, Rude, you've got two more games to go. We all know what United mean. I think we could see it when Bruno Fernandes scored that penalty. Have, have a look at this. Is, this. is this pure emotion from you? Van Nistelrooy gold? Oh, goodness. You didn't do that when you scored from the halfway line against Fulham, you know? No, <laughs> no. Yeah, the release was fantastic. Uh, it was a big moment to score, get get one nil up, and, and then you know, you know, at Old Trafford there will be a buzz around. And I was happy for Bruno, his third goal in two in two games. Um, so everything uh, came out, you know. It's a bit, bit of passion there as well. We love to see it. Listen, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Good luck this week. Thank you. All the best there in the studio. Good luck. Great. Thank you, Thanks Thank you very much care. indeed. Take care. Bye bye. That is rude, Van Nistelrooy, for you. Uh, live from Old Trafford. He does, we said it before the game, he does look and sound and feel the part. And you, and you know that. that. That emotion there, is it, that's not for show, is it? That's pure, no. genuine feelings from Ruben. Yeah, he, he was very emotional as a player, very driven. Yeah. Um, and look, I don't know if that many people have done it, have been a manager and then go back to being an assistant manager. It must be quite difficult. You've been in control. Then all of a sudden you have to go and listen to somebody else's ideas again, whether you agree with them or not. But he seems like he's, he's still interested in being there and helping the new man come to the club. I think he tried to help Eric as much as he could. But he just looks like a manager to me. I think he's handled himself, as I said there, I think he's handled himself really well this week and probably will do for the next couple of weeks or so as well while, while he's still in the job. And I, I think there could be a good manager job out there for him. It could be like almost a little public interview for him now these next couple of weeks. And I'm sure... People will like what they see. Similar to what Michael Carrick had the three games, didn't he? And then went to Middlesbrough in the, in the Championship off the back of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got a decent job that way. Michael hadn't done it before, so it was a little bit new. Rude's obviously been there, a, a good-sized club in Holland as well, and, uh, and won a trophy there as well. So, look, I, I think this will stand him in good stead. A win tonight, today against a, a good Chelsea team would have been good, but... He's got another two games to try and get a bit of credibility out there. He says he wants to stay at United, I'm sure he'll want to, but if there's a job that comes up, he, he looks like he's more than capable of taking it to He me. does love the club. 150 goals for Manchester United. I know you've said to me many, many times, you had this sort of special telepathic relationship for those couple of seasons with him when you played further forward, didn't you? Yeah, I love playing with Ruth. Um, played number 10 for that, for that season, really. Just, sometimes you have this click with somebody and it felt special. I knew what he wanted. I felt he knew what I wanted. And I've never seen such a ruthless goal scorer, such a ruthless finisher. When he got a chance, he was smashing it in the net. And he was obsessed with scoring goals, and that's, that was something we liked. 
Um, I think it, it's well known that the first thing he did was save Thierry on race code because he wanted to win the golden boot every single year. If, you know, if, if, if we do it, got beat five, one and he scored the one, he, he was all right. He, he was quite happy. <laughs> when well, no, no, I remember being there, I think he beat yeah. Newcastle 6 0, yeah. and he didn't, he didn't Dead score. Third. Yeah. And so I tried to speak bus. to him in the tunnel and yeah. he. Because he hadn't scored. Oh, he, he, won sucked, he sucked on the back of the bus, don't worry. And the first thing he did was check the other goal scorers next to him. It's on real score. So he's getting even worse at the back. <laughs> but no, I, I, look, I, I love playing. He, he was a winner as well. He, you know, he, he gave it a brilliant movement, brilliant technique. Everything was just ruthless about him. And he, he, he was a born winner. And I think, he's, I think we've seen it in these last couple of games. Very emotional, very emotional, very passionate mm. about about the club it probably didn't end as well as it should have done as, uh, as a player but he's still got a great record and some that I think everybody at the club still loves without stating the obvious they could do with a, a rude Van Nistelrooy mm. on the field at the moment because we saw a couple of missed chances again like Graham says they're just not falling and not going in at the moment yeah Rude wouldn't have enjoyed playing in this team um, like Skulls he said when he got the ball he knew Rude would be in the box I mean he scored all of his all bar one goal is it Steve in, in, we were in the penalty area yes you know, so he, he knew he had someone in there. I think Hoyland, you, you mentioned, had one touch in the penalty area, and that was his the penalty. What they, they, I mean, you, you need the service as a, as a player. You need to demand it, and they they are wasteful. I mean, they're not fantastic chances these, but they're still chances nonetheless. You know, and you have to do better with them. You have to be more clinical. Um, that one's a decent chance. It really is. I think Marcus does well for him. He lends it into him. Oh no, it's Fernandez. Good way to pass, as you would expect from him. Very good player, and he and he and he messes it up. You know, so you need to have a cool head in front of goal. And at the moment, that's not what they've got. But I feel sorry for the strikers because they're starved of chances. It's not as if they're creating chance after chance. Um, that one's a good chance. If you want that to fall to anyone, that's Bruno Fernandez. You know, you fancy him to score there, wouldn't you? Oh, it's, it's perfect for Bruno. Right? I think it's something the new manager has to address is the goals the goals Nine scored. in ten. Nine goals in ten games. Yeah, look, look it's nowhere near good. And, and they have had chances. I know Tim said they haven't created loads of chances today, especially, but throughout the season they have. I think it's a, it's a big area he's, he's got to get better. If you're, we, we talked beforehand about him getting United back up the league, back challenging for Europe. But the next step is then to go on and, and try and challenge for league title and hopefully Champions League down the road. He's got to address the goals thing. They've got, the lack of goals is, is a real problem. No, I, can, I go back to Arda and the four centre-forwards or centre-forwards we had right through. You look at 70, 80 goals between them. This is just a million miles off that. We've got one centre-forward. Yeah. We're not quite sure. He's, he's, he's a young lad. He, he looks capable. Can he get 20, 25 goals? We don't know. He looks more like a 10 to 15 man. Zerks who they brought in for 30, 40 million. It hasn't got off running yet where's the rest of them coming from Mark said that year where he scored 30 Ganacho looks again like he's capable more of a, a 10 to 15 rather than a 20 to 25 so I think the biggest job he's got is to find 70 80 goals in his team to get to elevate them to, to, to where they should be there's one at Sporting Lisbon at the moment he's absolutely on fire and yeah. I think you managed him didn't you Graham did manage yeah, him in his early part of his career yeah. you're going to uh, pronounce him sorry you're going to pronounce him as well Victor Gorkares yeah well, brilliant I think I didn't want Scalzi doing that. Victor, either. Victor would do. Victor. <laughs> <laughs> Big Victor. Um, no, I mean, I mean, I don't think they're going to get him in January, but that that is the obvious link with Ruben Amorim, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you put two and two together, it, it makes sense. I mean, whether the Sporting will sell him and whether you know, United have got the funds for that is another thing. But he's a player that that has surprised us a lot in terms of how how well he's done. He's went to Coventry, he had a fantastic period there and then gone to Sporting and has been absolutely you know, wonderful. So, yeah, he's a number nine that can score, but um, I think the first thing for the manager will be, what have I got here? What's the, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the current group of players? Because I don't think they'll, they'll have too much money to spend in January. No. Um, here's a man who knew how to put the ball in the net. Dimitar Berbatov back at Old Trafford, um, who's watched the game today in two goals. What did you make of it, Berber? I think it was a fair result in the end, 1-1. Although, looking at some of the chances here, again, I think at the end of the of the game, that chance that Bruno had should be a goal. I mean, the way he connects with the ball normally, giving the passes and shooting at the goal, he should do better than that, and he knows it. But in the end of the, of the day, I think it's a fair result, 1-1. That is a reoccurring theme and conversation, though, isn't it? We've just mentioned it. They've got nine goals in 10 league games. That's the lowest since 1973 at this stage of a season for Manchester United. It's a problem for the new manager coming in. 
It is. Look in the statistic and the data. It is a problem. But let's not forget that sometimes the strikers are depending on the midfield behind them. Do you feel sorry for them, Berber, in a way, those strikers? Uh, sometimes, yes, because I've been in the same position. And, for example, today, Hoyland, he put a lot of effort fighting. But most of the time, he was with the back against the goal. And that's the worst position a striker can be because you always have someone on your back breathing in your neck and it's not a good thing to do so you need to be in the half turn all the time and trying to see the goal as well uh, but again sometimes it's about the uh, the, the ball that you receive uh, and the supply of the ball and when the whole team is not performing well the strikers sometimes are suffering of this and if they don't score enough of course the blame gets to you because you're the striker so let's hope with coming of the new manager that problem will be resolved either with current striker getting better or the new manager bringing new strikers. Mm. When you blame the midfielder, Scolzi jumped out of his chair, so he wants to come in. <laughs> no, Scolzi we, we, was unbelievable, and, and he knows how to look for me or for the other players that he used to play. And sometimes, of course, it's about the movement of the, of the, of the United players in attack as well. Uh, but most of the time, it comes, of course, down to the quality and how you read the game, how you look for the space. And uh, sometimes it's easy now from the outside to look and to criticise. Inside is more difficult. Well, but, but I just think obviously I, I look at the midfield area of the pitch quite a bit. Do you think it is actually a lack of movement or a lack of clever movement from the forward players or the lack of control in midfield? I, I felt today watching the game there was a real lack of control from both teams and they really struggled, United especially, to bring Bruno into the game and Cole Palmer. Is that the way you saw it as well? I, I think the word that you used, clever, is probably the right one. The clever movement and the clever way of passing the ball, knowing when to pass the ball, the decision of knowing when to pass the ball, uh, either when the, the guy makes the right movement and then you need to, to see him in advance, of course, to read the game and to pass him the ball. But that word clever uh, is the key word because the most intelligent players, and you know better than me because you are that type of player, to know when to pass the ball in the right and exact moment because that can make the difference. And of course, for example, the, the, the penalty incident, Hoyland should do better on that because he had a bad touch on the ball. It was a perfect ball and he needed to control it and finish. But he was a bit lucky to escape it and go down for the penalty. So sometimes it's a lot of component needs to fit together to have the, the perfect pass, the perfect chance, etc. But you need to deal with the ugly situation as well and you know how to react and to score. Fascinating. Baba, thank you very much indeed. We'll see you soon. Keep thank warm. You thank you. <laughs> 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 and that is uh, Dimitar Berbatov live at Old Trafford after the 1-1. One, one. Well, Enzo, are you happy, unhappy? How do you feel about what you've seen? No, we knew that uh, it was a difficult game for different reasons, mentally, in, in different aspects. I think for big part of the, the game, we manage and we control quite, quite well. Probably the last 10 minutes, we lost a little bit of balance, probably for the desire to, to win the game. But... Uh, in any case, you are no, you, you don't have to lose the, the balance. You said before the match you thought United might be tactically different today with Ruud van Nistelrooy in charge and he might have to adjust. Did you have to do that? Uh, I think overall they were quite similar. Uh, probably we, did, we expect them a bit more uh, aggressive, but uh, overall I think uh, that... Uh, the game was the game was quite clear. Uh, and just tell us, at half time, you made a change with Gusto coming off, Cucurella coming on, and then James switching sides. Tactical, I guess. Tell us what the thinking was. No, yeah, it was just a tactical decision. No more than that. Fortunately, uh, Maru is not injured, nothing. So we try something different. But was there a spell second half? Like you, you kind of said in your first answer, it felt like you had sort of control of a lot of the match and then just around them going ahead maybe you lost that control a little bit yeah exactly but uh, you know in this in this stadium against this team when you go down it's very difficult to come back and we did that that is the most difficult thing then we try to win and as i said probably the last 10 minutes we lost a little bit of balance and we conceded something but uh, overall as you said i think for Part of the game we control quite well. I think um, Moises Caicedo didn't have the easiest start to his Chelsea career, which is obviously before you took charge. Is he becoming a really important player and is he, is he now giving his best football to the club? I don't know before, I said many times, with us since we arrived he's doing fantastic and we are very happy with him and with all of, uh, all of them.
Uh, any complaints uh, about United's penalty or possibly a red card challenge towards the end, Martinez? Anything you want to say about that? To be honest, I didn't watch back the the penalty, but uh, yes, they just show me the the last the, the foul with the call that I I think there is not the intention to take the ball and the foul is quite dangerous. Uh, but again, they are there to take a decision. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, it's a little bit unhappy about the Martinez challenge on Cole Palmer. Let's have a look at it. Was a yellow fair? VAR had a long look at this. I think in the end, I really do. I just think that it's, it is a little bit vicious, to be honest. Uh, and if he would have sent him off, no complaints, and I don't think it would have been overturned. But uh, yeah, they stuck with the on-field decision, and I think quite rightly. You see him there. Cole just drops his shoulder, he goes by him, and he just raises his leg, makes sure there's no way you're getting past me, and he hits him on the knee. I mean, it is, it's, it's naughty. He said in his press conference, Enzo Maresca, a definite red. Well, there's lots of the replay, and I, uh, yeah, I think it probably is a red. Um, quite dangerous, scrapes his studs right down his knee. Doesn't get low of contacts that possibly saved him a little bit. It's more of a scrape than a, a aggressive stab, but yeah, I think he's quite lucky. We saw Bruno Fernandes get sent off against Madison in a similar, didn't we? Similar challenge where he wasn't like full on, it was like a glancing blow. Yeah. Exactly like that, same height, and Bruno got sent off. Like I say, if it would have been a red card, I don't think VAR would have overturned it. Graham? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think when you look at it there, his height, it's a bit... It's a, it's a bit reckless uh, the speed he's going into as Paul said the fact that he doesn't really contact him mm. probably saves him but it doesn't look great especially on the, on the replay when it slowed up a bit mm. and there was also an incident in the first half after the uh, woodwork was struck by Chelsea involving Roberto uh, Roberto Lissandro Martinez and Colwell and we're hearing that Colwell thinks this might be a penalty well yeah the, the problem is contact but before that we, we, we see the push from um, I, can't, I can't remember somebody pushes Casemiro Casemiro, don't they yeah. so it's Casemiro gets pushed Madueke, yeah. it, 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 it never come to that point anyway, I don't think it, but Colwell might have felt it but he's obviously not seen the first bit and I think that would have been overturned anyway OK here is uh, the quick reaction then on that from Levi Colwell Can I ask you about a moment in the first half as well there seemed to have been some analysis about the Sandro Martinez challenge on you as you were yeah. as you were striking the ball what did you think? You know I think if I'd done that it had been a pen so you thought it should have been a penalty then? Yeah, in my opinion, he's kicked me. I've gone to kick the ball and he's kicked me. You might expect him to say that, you know him well, but uh, <laughs> what do, you, do you think he's slightly got a point there? or Only in as much as it's a slight kick. I think, mm. uh, as Paul said, the, the, the push would have ruled everything out, so it doesn't matter whether you kicked him or not. It's, I, I, I just think it's a blatant push from Madueke to Casemiro, and I think VAR, VAR would, have, would have ruled that out, so I'm lucky. So uh, no penalty for me. Even in isolation, without the push, yeah. which rules everything out, as Scolzi rightly says, not enough. Not enough contact. No. Glancing blow. Yes, he's kicked him. You have to watch that ten times to realise he's, he's kicked him. So, no, not for me. OK, bigger picture. Ten games in. Chelsea are in the top four. They were in the bottom half this stage last season. Where are they, where are they at, your former club? For you, do you think? I think they'll be happy with the progress they're making. I think Enzo's come in and done a, a really good job, you know, stabilised things on the back of Maurizio's work towards the back end of the season. So they've got a good group of young players, still need to improve in certain areas. They're finding their, their feet a little bit in terms of how they want to build up and how they want to use Cole Palmer to a certain extent. Um, but they'll be happy with being in the top four. They're, 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 they're competing. I think, as Tim said, are they ready to challenge at the top of the league now? Probably not. But they'll be in the top four. They'll aim for that, I think, in this, at the end of the season. Um, and they're looking a decent place. Having experienced what you did, do you see a little bit of stability, which hasn't always been there at Chelsea going back through the years, finally emerging, and a bit of realism? Well, I think uh, uh, over time, history can tell a different different story. I think the, the owners have, have, have come into the club and wanted to change things around quite a lot. Uh, new owners, new sporting director, new everything. So, And when you change the amount of players that Chelsea have changed, it, it, it makes sense that there's a bit of transition and results aren't what you want in terms of the short term. But the, when you come through that period, you've got a bunch of young players that are in the team that are, have been identified as being you know, really talented that the club can go forward with, the likes of Palmer, 
um, the likes of Kaiseido, the likes of Jackson and Kunku, et cetera, et cetera. So they've, they've got a core group there that they can work with. Um, but at Chelsea, a bit like Manchester United, uh, you're not too far away from a crisis. So they have to keep you know, on, that, on that path. And the, the most difficult thing with these big clubs is the emotion and the passion that the fans have. And, and, and when you don't win, you, you're close to, like I said, like, you're close to a crisis, which means that you can't make good decisions sometimes. You, you get caught up in the, in, the, in the mess of it all. And um, Chelsea just need to be stable. And if they are, they've got some good foundations to work with, I think. Was that a source of frustration at times for you with all the, the, the players you had, all the number of games you had to play when the new owners come in? Well, it's part of the challenge, and, and I think as we've alluded to today, if you're at these clubs and the results aren't um, what you want and the, and, 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 and the owners or whoever else, sometimes it's the media, sometimes it's the supporters, they think, well, it must be the coach's fault, then you understand that's your job and you have to pay for that. But when, the, when you look at the situation, you zoom out from it, when you look at the amount of players that have turned over in that club over two or three windows... On the one hand, when they come through it, they'll be in a better place. But in the meantime, if that sort of sledgehammer approach in a way, there's a bit of collateral damage. And, and, and I think in the end, I, I experienced that collateral damage. At the same time, I had a wonderful time there in terms of Champions League experience and managing a club like that. It's, it's fantastic for your development and education. But at the same time, it was maybe the, the, you know, not, not the best of times to go in with all the rest of the stuff that was going on. And they still have this issue, don't they? Menzo Marasco's made it perfectly clear to certain players he's not in his plan. Ben Chilwell is one yeah. um, who couldn't find the club or they couldn't yeah. get him out, but he's still at the club, just, just to name one, yeah. whilst the other uh, rest of the squad are in the, with the first team. Yeah, which is a big problem. We, t- we talked about it with Man United as well. It's, it's hard for a new manager to come in and stamp his authority on like years ago when there was no transfer window and there was no financial restraints on clubs. They could just get rid of players and bring a new lot in or bring a new Chelsea's case, it could just keep bringing them in. And no matter what happens, just leave them there and let them play in the reserves or don't play. But now you can't do that. You know, you have to name your squad and you have to try and balance the books accordingly. It's very difficult when they're on very long contracts, like Chelsea were putting them on six, seven-year contracts, to try and get rid of them boys and get someone to take them for the same money what they're earning. Forget the fee, what you're going to have to write off in the first place. Really, really difficult. So it's a tough job for Maresco. It's a tough job for, for Ruben Amarin, who's coming in at Man United, because not only because you can't bring players in who you'd well like to and to make the transition quicker, the period quicker, you have to try and develop and put your stamp on the players who are already there and improve them. And that is the task what they have to do. But you have to do that in, in, in a big environment with a huge squad. And sometimes you get some disgruntled players who can affect the mentality of your group you want to work with. It's a really difficult balancing act, but, you know, it's a great challenge. As Graham says, you know, that's that's why we're in the game. You know, someone will reap the rewards of people like Graham and Pochettino who have been in there at the wrong time. Someone will go in there at Chelsea when when it's all settled down. They've stabled the ship and all of a sudden they start winning football matches. The crowd are all on side and you get the benefit from that. But it takes a lot of hardship and rejection in the meantime to get to that stage. And I think that they're in a, they're in a journey at the moment, Chelsea, a real journey. And I think that they are, I believe they're in the same similar journey, but a little bit ahead of Man United. Man United has just got a new man coming in the door now, but he's going to find really difficult challenges, not only him, but the technical staff to try and remove some players who you don't want. He needs to get in there as quickly as possible, sort out which ones he want, which ones he want to take, to journey, take along with him on the journey, and they need to help him out and try and clear the ship. Are, are Chelsea heading in the right direction, though, uh, at the moment, even with some players cast aside with this young group that Graham's alluding to? Yeah, I think so. It, it feels like they're going the right way. As Tim said, I think the further down the development than Man- Manchester United, obviously the, the table will probably make that look quite obvious I think the thing at these big clubs is expectation and managing um, that and managing the expe- expectation of, of course is because they're expected to win Chelsea obviously had a great run under Marino winning league titles Manchester United had it with Sir Alex so when you say when you, when you lose a game it, it's a disaster and you lose two games it's, it's an absolute crisis and, and the world is over but he's going to have to cope with this Amarin's going to have to come in Obviously, he's got his philosophy he, he sticks to. We know about the 3-4-3. Three, three. He has to work out quickly if he can do that with these players. Um, 
that will probably take a little bit of time and the time's probably not there to settle down because he's got to start winning games quickly to, to try and get him up to that top seat, try and get him into, into European places. So, it, look, it's, it, it's going to be difficult. But I say, I, I look at Manchester United's team, forget about Chelsea for now. I'm sick of talking about Chelsea. <laughs> but we, need, we need to bring goals to the team. Goals are the things that win your games of football. They win your league. I know we are talking about defences and stuff, but if, if you're a team at the top of the table who struggle to score goals... It's so what, what's the solution for him short term? Because we've said he can't do anything until January at the earliest and probably even then until the summer. So with that group that he's going to inherit? I think it's just a little bit of turn, turn of luck, really. Um, when I say look, probably quality comes into it as well because as we've seen, we've seen so many clips of chances is missed. They've had spells in games where they have been good. Now them spells aren't, aren't always enough. If you think of the West Ham game last week where they could have been three, four goals up at our time, then they come out and lose the game and don't perform. So he's got to try and find a way to bring some confidence into him. I think Rude will try and do that. They obviously had that in midweek, but going into Premier League, it's a different kettle of fish. But I think there is the talent there to do it. We, we know Rashford can do it. We know Bruno can do it. As I said before, Hoyland, he, he can finish. But again, I don't think he's a 20, 25 goal a season man. I think Ganacho needs to tidy himself up. I think technically he's quite scruffy at times. Um, but I think he, he... But that can be worked on, can it? I think it can be worked on, yeah. I think somebody like Rude would be the one to possibly help him. I think scoring goals is probably the hardest thing to do in the game, and these two might tell you different, but I think it's probably the hardest thing to coach. Because you, you can give people an idea how to, finish, how to finish, but if that is actually in front of you, and you have to think in a split moment like that, you have to choose the right finishers. You have to be able to put the ball where, where you want it to go, and that's why the best forwards I with my cloning we work with, Ruth Van Nistelrooy, when they get in that position, their eyes cold, and they can score and finish, and they always choose the right one. The Manchester United chat will go on and on. Graham, thank you very much for being with us. Enjoy your company. Thank you. Tim and Paul, as always, uh, Ruth Van Nistelrooy's Premier League life starts with a point from the four of us. We'll see you soon. Take care.